Hello and welcome to this Edexcel A-Level Geography Enquiry Question Review. This one is looking at Coast Enquiry Question 1. Why are coastal landscapes different and what processes cause these differences? So as always, we will be looking first off with the specification. This is important because it introduces us to all of the key terms that we're going to be needing to be looking at. It will be the language that's going to be used within the exam in the type of questions, but also the type of language you're going to be expected to use in your answers as well. So, as always, we have the main key ideas and the detailed content that goes alongside them. With the explain questions, you're looking at probably just one area of the detailed content from each of the key ideas. Whereas when you're looking at the assess and the evaluate questions, it may be linking some of these different detailed content zones and possibly different information from the different key ideas as well. So when we look at this, we can see we've got four main or three main different areas, the coastal classification, the geological structure and the positional landforms. So first of all, we're looking at coastal classification. Um, it's easy to see on the Valentin model here of how the different coastal classifications are at different um, ends of the spectrum. So we can have the erosional coastlines, which tend to be higher energy. Um, and when you have softer rock, it could lead to crumbling cliffs, uh, the retreating coastline. Um, if we have a harder rock, we may find it steeper cliffs on a more stationary coastline. On the other side of that, in a low energy area, we can get more depositional landforms, the coastal plains, um, where we may find features such as sand dunes and salt marshes. And these may be considered sort of advancing uh, coastlines. We also need to consider as well whether they are emerging, as in the land is becoming above sea level or submerging, and that the sea level is rising and the land is getting lower in relation to it. So these are the main sort of spectrums of coastal classifications. But we can also classify in terms of the tidal range from the micro, where the tides are between 0 and 2 metres, or the macro, which are sort of greater than 4 metres between the high tide and low tide mark in terms of height of sea level, uh, not the distance along the beach. We can also classify in different time scales in geological, where we're talking about millions of years, in glacial time periods, tens of thousands, um, but also much shorter, we can see changes in coastline on a seasonal, um, but also on a tidal or a storm um, surge can change the coast. When classifying the coast, we also need to look at the littoral zone. This is sort of the wider coastal zone with some of the key zones being the backshore, which is the cliffs, the top end of the beach, um, and the land next to the uh, beaches and cliffs. We've got the near shore, which tends to be often where the breaking waves are, um, and the intertidal zone between the low tide and the high tide mark. We also then begin to have the offshore, which is those which is always submerged by water, and there is less action of the waves but certainly there will be action of currents and littoral drifts. So those are the different coastal classifications. Now, we come to look at the structure of the rocks at coast and how these relate to geographical and coastal landscapes. Now, it's important to recognise that landscapes are different to landforms in the specification. Landscapes tend to be much wider areas and landscapes will include lots of different land forms. When we're talking about geological structure, we are looking at how different rock types relate to each other. Are they in terms of the, the cliffs or how the different rock bands lie on top of each other, the angle, etc., or how the bands of harder and softer rock line up either parallel or angled to the shore? So when we're looking at geological structure, looking at sort of coastlines and cliff formations, we look at these areas here. You look at the layers of the rocks. Yeah, 
do the different layers of different hardnesses of rocks or when they settled at different times um, and how that might impact the cliff structure. The tilting is also important in terms of the rock, whether the rock strata are tilting uh, towards the sea or towards the land. If it's a horizontal banding, it tends to be a more vertical cliff. Um, if it's a seaward tilt, then you might get sort of more of an angled cliff. A landward tilt might again give you more steeper cliffs. But the geological structure is also important in terms of faulting and the weaknesses which may be susceptible to erosion, weathering and mass movement. On a larger scale, we can then start to look at the concordant and discordant coastlines. Concordant coastlines are where the rocks uh, are formed in parallel formations to the shoreline. Um, and this may give us uh, coastlines such as the Dalmatian coastline of the Croatian coast, where we get these long offshore islands, um, which were uh, shaped by tectonic activity and then flooded by uh, sea level change. You also have the half coastlines in Northern Europe, which are very much more sort of depositional sandbars um, and lagoons which form off the coasts. So again, here we have a submerging coast and an emerging coastline here. The area around Dorset is also a good example of a concordant coastline, particularly along the Lulworth Cove to Dirtle Door area, whereby you have a harder layer of rock face next to the sea. But this has been eroded in certain areas because of faulting and weaknesses. And this has exposed some of the weaker clays behind it, leading to some very interesting landforms. Um, and then behind that, a harder layer of chalk, which reduces the erosion and again is important in the formation of the landscapes along that coastline. In addition to this, you can have discordant coastlines where the rocks are angled towards the shore. And this is where we tend to find features such as headlands and bays where the headlands are the harder rock protruding out to sea and the bays are the more easily eroded softer rocks which are eroded forming these inlets, often deposition forming in them, creating beaches in there. And a good example of this is again on the Dorset coastline, but this on the easterly facing side of Swanage Bay, um, from sort of Ped Peveril Point to Swanage Bay to the rocks at Old Harry. So that's the geological structure and how they relate to each other. Now, something which is similar, but is very different in this terms of this specification is the lithology of the rock. And you must differentiate between geological structure and lithology. The lithology is the characteristics of the individual rock types. Now, in some areas, the geological structure will include rocks of different lithology. Now, the main types of rock in terms of lithology are the igneous rocks, the volcanic rocks, which tend to be very slow to erode. We then have the metamorphic rocks. These could be volcanic or sedimentary rocks, um, which have been formed under great heat and pressure, which makes them very dense and very hard. And again, likely to be very slow erosion rates. We then have the sedimentary rocks. These are the rocks which were formed sort of under pressure under seabeds and under lakes from the sediment binding together over many hundreds of thousands and millions of years. Now there can be wide ranging different levels of hardness of these um, from grit stones and sandstones to the more harder wearing limestone. Um, so these would tend to be considered more moderate speed of erosion. But again, there are great variations within each of these different rock types. Finally, the, the last main type is the unconsolidated rock type. These are the clays and soils often deposited by glaciers at the end of the last ice age along the Holden S coastline. Now, because these are unconsolidated, they're not bound together and they will all often have a very fast erosion rate particularly in areas of high wave energy. 
Now, another feature of rocks that you need to consider is the permeability or impermeability. The whether the water can travel through the rocks or whether the water will get trapped in the rocks. This is very important as it can link to uh, lubrication for forms of mass movement and weathering, which can also have a great impact on the recession of coastlines. It's important to realise that recession of coastlines relates to um, lithology, the erosional energy, the wave types, transportation, mass movement and weathering. So recession is a mixture of all of those different things. Finally, for inquiry question one, um, we have these areas of mainly low energy, low energy um, and the formation of coastal plains, which tend to be depositional landforms. Now, there are two main types of these. There are the sand dunes and the salt marshes. Now, with sand dunes, what you tend to get is vegetation, dead seaweed builds up at the uh, high tide line. The wind and alien processes will slowly cover this with sand. And as that vegetation um, starts to decay, it would put nutrients into the soil. And within this Samosia, you will tend to get these pioneer plants, which can take these very difficult conditions. Often in sand dunes, mar marum grass will be the pioneer species, as these are what we call xerophytes. They can cope with dry and salty conditions. Now, over time, the marum grass traps more sand and it builds up and the beach builds up in front of that, sort of extending or advancing out to sea, creating a new high tide line, leading to more erosion, uh, more deposition of dead plant material. And then the sand dune starts to build again. And over time, the breakdown of this material, the vegetation, the roots bind the sediment and connects more material and then changes the nutrient makeup of the uh, sand dune system. Therefore, more different types of plant can grow. And so we get this plant succession running through it. Salt marshes, which often form behind um, spits, um, are often created by the building up of um, river sediment as it flows out and then is deposited in the more sheltered area. Now, again, what we had here is a halosea, and we have halophytes, which are the pioneer species here. And these are uh, able to be submerged under the salty water for most of the day. Now, as these plants start to grow, they can trap more and more sediment until the mud flats grow higher and higher so they become less submerged by water or they become in the open air for longer and longer and then again we start to see more types of plant succession and again traps more material the vegetation breaks down take changes the nutrient content of the soil below it allowing for new successive species to grow on it until eventually the salt marsh much of the salt marsh will be above the tide line for all but the very highest of times. And there tends to be lots of drainage channels where the water can flow out very easily. Now, these both are very good because they can respond to sea level change. As the sea levels change, if they change slowly enough, then the salt marshes and sand dunes can both sort of grow and be able to adapt to that. But because they are on consolidated material, they are very susceptible to storm damage and to human actions as well. So there we have the main coastal landscapes, the definitions and the coastal characteristics. The idea of how they link together in advancing or retreating coastlines, erosional, depositional, submerging or emerging. Tidal ranges and timescales, the different zones, the difference between geological structure and lithology, and then the low energy coastal plains as well. So I hope that's been of use. Thanks for watching and see you again soon. Thank you. Bye.